Good evening. Welcome back. Thanks for joining us again. Okay, so how did Silvio Gassel propose to solve the problems with our existing form of money? To once again reiterate the central issue, Gassel says that by designing money to perform the store of value function in addition to the medium of exchange function, we inadvertently made it superior to real goods and services as a form in which to hold wealth. A consequence of this superiority is that money does not meet with goods and services on a level playing field when it mediates their exchange. If we consider direct exchange of goods and services as a baseline scenario, we observed that it's universally true that tangible wealth imposes costs on its holders. Whether that's due to physical decay, costs of storage and maintenance, or technical technological obsolescence, the physical nature of goods and services compels their sale sooner rather than later. This means that when exchange takes place between producers of goods and services, there's pressure to transact on both sides of every negotiation. Therefore, if money is to be a neutral medium to facilitate exchange, without changing the terms of those exchanges, it must meet goods and services on a level playing field as well. If it doesn't, the terms of exchange will be affected by money and it will therefore not be a neutral medium. As we've seen, this is the case with traditional forms of money and both Gassell and Keynes attribute the existence of interest and all of its harmful consequences to the non-neutrality of money. So the goal of Gassell's proposal is to make money neutral, period. As I've said before, one of the reasons why both the classical economists and the Marxists failed to understand the true causes of poverty, economic injustice, and instability is because they didn't understand the non-neutrality of money, which makes sense since, as I said before, they basically ignored money. From their perspectives, exchanging apples for lumber is essentially the same as exchanging apples for gold money and then gold money for lumber. But as we've seen with traditional money, that's not the case. Exchanging apples for money and money for lumber will not lead to the same result as directly exchanging apples for lumber. Therefore, money as we know it is not a neutral medium of exchange. Making money a neutral medium of exchange is the whole purpose of Gassell's proposed monetary reform. And he tells us that in order to accomplish that, money must meet with goods and services on a level playing field. So how can we establish a level playing field between goods and services and money? As Gassell observes, we cannot tamper with goods. They are the primary factor to which everything else must be adapted. But let's look a little more closely at money, for here some alteration may prove feasible. Must money always remain what it is at present? Must money as a commodity be superior to the commodities which, as a medium of exchange, it is meant to serve? In the case of fire, flood, crisis, war, changes of fashion, and so forth, is money alone to be immune from damage? Why must money be superior to the goods which it is to serve? And is not the superiority of money to goods the privilege which we found to be the cause of surplus value? Let us then make an end of the privileges of money. Nobody, not even savers, speculators, or capitalists, must find money as a commodity pref preferable to the contents of the markets, shops, and warehouses. If money is not to hold sway over goods, it must deteriorate as they do. Let it be attacked by moth and rust. Let it sicken, let it run away. And when it comes to die, let its possessor pay to have the carcass flayed and buried. Then, and not till then, shall we be able to say that money and goods are on an equal footing and perfect equivalence. So how does Gassell propose to accomplish that? What would a form of money that would meet with goods and services on an equal footing look like? Gassell writes, only money that goes out of date like a newspaper, rots like potatoes, rusts like iron, evaporates like ether, is capable of standing the test as an instrument for the exchange of potatoes, newspapers, iron, and ether. 
So we must make money worse as a commodity if we wish to make it better as a medium of exchange. As the owners of goods are always in a hurry for exchange, it is only just and fair that the owners of money, which is the medium of exchange, should also be in a hurry. Supply is something detached from the will of the owners of goods. So demand must become something detached from the will of owners of money. As the law of gravity knows no moods, so the law of demand will know none. Supply is under a direct compulsion inherent in the nature of wares. And for this reason, I propose a similar compulsion for demand. In the process of setting the price, supply would then no longer be at a disadvantage in comparison with demand. So how can we make demand automatic? How can we separate the circulation of money from the will of its holders? The answer is demurrage. Demurrage is a word that originally comes from the shipping industry. It refers to a charge that is assessed to the operator of a ship that fails to load or unload within the agreed upon time frame. A ship that takes longer than it's supposed to to unload, to load or unload affects the ability of other ships to do likewise. Therefore, a financial penalty is assessed to discourage such behavior. Demurrage money applies the same principle. Gassell writes, money is not a feather bed. It is a moment's halting place by the roadside. So demurrage money is like a ship that has a limited time frame during which it can load and unload. And if its holder delays, thereby impeding the loading and unloading of others who need access to that money, the person responsible incurs a penalty. The way that penalty is assessed is through a gradual but steady reduction in the purchasing power of money. The specific rate of that reduction proposed by Gassell was 5.2% per year or 0.1% per week. So let's think about the effects of demurrage. It would have a negligible effect on anyone using money as a medium of exchange. If you receive your pay in demurrage money and use it during the following days and weeks to purchase goods and services, the demurrage charge would be almost imperceptible. Even if you wait a month to spend your money, the loss due to the demurrage would be less than half a percent. Demurrage would only have a meaningful impact on those who hold money for long periods of time. That one change, putting money on a level playing field with the goods and services it's used to exchange, would eliminate the privileges of money and thereby solve all of the problems that result from those privileges. Unhoardable goods and services would meet with unhoardable money to negotiate exchanges and the universal compulsion to circulate that applies to both sides of every barter transaction would also apply to both sides of every exchange intermediated by money. Money would then no longer be able to exact tribute. This in turn would result in the gradual disappearance of interest and the removal of the artificial limit on the production of capital which, according to Gassell, is the real cause of what Marx called surplus value, the exploitative power of the means of production. He tells us that this, in conjunction with the associated land reform, which we'll discuss in the next class, would enable the free market system to finally deliver on its promise of a rising tide that lifts all boats. That's it. That's the whole Gassellian monetary reform. Okay, so now let's think about a few related topics. The most, frequent ask, the, no, the most frequently asked question when people first hear of the idea of demurrage is why do we need demurrage when we already have inflation? This is a reasonable question since it's a well-established fact that over any long period of time, inflation erodes the purchasing power of our modern form of fiat money which means that it is not well suited for use as a long-term store of value. So one might ask, doesn't that solve the problem? Well, no, it doesn't. Here's why. While it's true that inflation makes money a bad store of value on average, it does not do so under all economic conditions. All we need to do is recall Gassell's statement that commerce is mathematically impossible with falling prices 
to see why modern fiat money has the same problems as gold money, even in spite of the fact that inflation erodes its value over time. Let's think about why that is. One of the key differences between demurrage and inflation is that demurrage is consistent and predictable. It's always the same. In good times and in bad times, demurrage reduces the purchasing power of money by the same amount each and every week. Inflation, on the other hand, is inconsistent, unpredictable, and constantly changing. Sometimes inflation is high, sometimes it's low, and sometimes it reverses itself and becomes negative. So can you see why inflation is not a solution to the problem of the mathematical impossibility of commerce with falling prices? Because by definition, if prices are falling, there's no inflation. There's its opposite, deflation. And regardless of whether we're talking about gold-backed money or unbacked fiat money, any time prices fall, the purchasing power of money increases. And that rewards those who withhold money from circulation. So the disincentive to hoarding, which is sometimes provided by inflation, disappears completely and becomes its opposite, a reward to hoarding, precisely at the times when society most needs money to circulate. While inflation means that on average money is not a feather bed, it becomes a feather bed exactly when, it, when we need it not to. Demurrage money, on the other hand, provides the same incentive to keep money circulating in all economic environments. This is the most important difference between demurrage and inflation. When it matters most, demurrage money and conventional fiat money behave in exactly opposite manners to one another. This is the answer to the question that's come up multiple times in the Q&A portion of previous classes regarding whether or not we already have Gesellian money because conventional fiat money loses power on average due to inflation. The answer is categorically no. The effect of inflation on modern fiat money is not just not the same as demurrage, it is directly opposite demurrage when it matters most. Another very important difference between demurrage and inflation is that inflation affects both existing currency and future cash flows. Demurrage only affects currently existing outstanding units of currency. It has no effect on future cash flows. So it incentivizes people to put money they currently have back into circulation, but it does not affect the future purchasing power of salaries, pensions, and other fixed income streams. In fact, as we'll see shortly, demurrage is actually the best way to avoid inflation and thus preserve the purchasing power of future cash flows. So once again, despite their apparent similarities, in some very important respects, demurrage and inflation actually work in exactly opposite ways. So no, the fact that our existing form of fiat currency generally loses value over time due to inflation absolutely does not mean that we already have Gesellian currency. Now let's discuss a related aspect of the differences between modern fiat money and demurrage money, specifically how they affect prices. As I've discussed in previous classes, the general price level in the economy is a function of two things, the amount of money in existence and the velocity with which that money circulates. So if one wishes to adjust the price level, there are two levers that one can use, the money supply and the velocity of money. And this is a crucial difference between conventional approaches to monetary policy, including that of Keynes and Gassell. The former used the lever of the quantity of money. Gassell uses the lever of the velocity of money. This is a critical difference. Let's think about the differences between attempting to regulate the price level via the money supply versus via the velocity of money. If we attempt to support prices during periods of economic weakness by increasing the quantity of money, we risk falling into the situation that we previously described as pushing on a string. Under our existing system, the monetary authorities can create unlimited quantities of new money but they cannot force that money to circulate. 
We just lived through a case study of such a situation following the financial crisis of 2008. For a decade plus, the world's central banks created massive, unprecedented sums of new monetary reserves and cut interest rates to zero or even below zero. But they were unable to compel that money to flow into the productive economy, thereby stimulating production and employment. Instead, for the most part, it just served to inflate massive asset bubbles. And what happened when things finally did turn around and prices began to rise? The economy was like a flooded engine with huge amounts of fuel pooled throughout the system. What happens with pooled fuel once the engine finally starts to fire? It, all, it ignites all at once and causes an explosion. This is why we went very quickly from, from one extreme to the other, from having to fend off deflation by whatever means necessary to suddenly seeing inflation get out of hand. It's obvious why demurrage is a solution to the problem of deflation, but what's less obvious is the fact that it's the solution to inflation as well. Let's think about why this is. The purpose of demurrage is to maximize the velocity of money under all economic conditions. If money is always circulating at the maximum possible velocity, where could inflation possibly come from if the quantity of money remains the same? Since demurrage money would always remain in motion, there would be no piles of idle money sitting on the sidelines which can be suddenly mobilized. There would be no pools of fuel waiting to ignite and explode. And there would also be little possibility of increased monetary velocity, since money would always be circulating near the maximum velocity possible given the existing state of commercial organization. So what could cause a sudden rise of, of prices? It's mathematically impossible. So once again, not only are demurrage and inflation not the same things, demurrage is actually the cure for inflation. This also sheds light on the related question of whether money should have backing. Proponents of hard money see rampant money creation in our modern fiat system and conclude that what's needed is a return to the gold standard. According to this view, backed money is the way to avoid out of control money creation and thus stabilize prices. This is a superficially appealing argument because it starts from the completely valid perspective of objecting to the endless expansion of the money supply that's necessary with our current form of money. But hard money never has and never will produce enduring price stability. Supporters of the gold standard tend to consider the terms hard money and sound money as synonyms. But from a Gesellian perspective, the terms hard money and sound money are actually antonyms. Remember Gesell's statement, the power of money to affect exchanges, its technical quality from the mercantile standpoint is in inverse proportion to its technical quality from the banking standpoint. Hard money or backed money is good if you want money to be a store of value. But as we've discussed at length, making money a good store of value means making it a bad medium of exchange. And in fact, hard money ensures that prices will not be stable because its portability means that velocity will always fall when prices are already falling and always rise when prices are already rising. Hard money not only doesn't achieve price stability, it actually causes price instability. On the subject of whether money should have backing, Gassell says the following. It is not the money material, but the function of money as the medium of exchange that covers money and ensures the economic demand for it. In the last analysis, money is covered by the inexhaustible treasures brought within reach of humanity by the division of labor. Where is the covering of a railway share? Does it consist of rails and embankments? Everyone knows that the covering of a railway share is the mass of goods daily offered for transport. The division of labor is the covering of the railway share. And the same is true in the, pri in the privileges of money. That is to say of the possession of money itself. If freight and passengers fail, the railway share is rubbish. If the division of labor and the stream of wares ceases, money is the most useless of objects. Paper money then becomes waste paper, 
and metal money, raw material for the least important of industries. So according to Gassell, backing is not only unnecessary for a medium of exchange, it is in fact counterproductive. Let's now think some more about the differences between attempting to regulate the price level via the lever of money supply versus the lever of the velocity of money. To make this point, I like to compare the economy to a bicycle. Money is the chain that transmits force from the pedals to the wheels. Our existing form of money is like a chain with a bunch, with a bunch of slack in it. Because it is not well fitted to the gears of the real economy, it moves in a jerky fashion. Sometimes it moves too fast, and other, other times it moves too slow. The conventional Keynesian approach to avoiding deflation, unemployment, and economic crises is that every time the chain seizes up, we add links to it. Sometimes this alleviates the immediate problem, sometimes it doesn't. But by continuously adding more links, we create more and more slack in the chain. This creates bigger and bigger problems in the future, since the increasing slack weakens the connection between the pedals and the wheels. With more and more slack in the chain, we have to execute more extreme maneuvers in order to achieve the desired results. And eventually we get to a point where it becomes essentially impossible to control the bicycle. My personal view is that this is where we're currently at with the conventional monetary system. We just went through an extended period of unprecedented extreme monetary policy, and there's so much slack in the chain that I doubt we can ever bring it back under control. Continuing with the analogy, the Gesellian solution is essentially the opposite of the Keynesian approach. Whereas the latter requires more and more links to be added to the chain, resulting in more and more slack over time, the Gesellian approach aims to have no slack in the chain whatsoever. If there's no slack, small adjustments in the quantity of money become powerful and precise tools for adjusting the speed of the wheels. Under such a system, the monetary authorities would no longer be pushing on a string. They would be pushing on a ramrod. As Gassell writes, if money were under compulsion to circulate, minute changes in the quantity of money would suffice to make demand fit like a glove the natural variations of production. Only minute changes in the quantity of money would be necessary to adjust the to the natural variations of the real economy because rapidly and consistently circulating money would be a precise and reliable mechanism for transmission of energy from the pedals to the wheels. And this further illustrates how demurrage is not only the solution to deflation, it is also the solution to inflation. If money is always circulating at its maximum velocity and the quantity of money remains the same, where could unexpected variations in the price level in either direction possibly come from? So this is yet another illustration of the fact that modern fiat money is not Gesellian money just because it loses purchasing power on average over time. Conventional fiat money does not stabilize the velocity of money. It does the opposite. When prices begin to fall, conventional money behaves exactly like gold-backed money and exacerbates the downward movement in prices by incentivizing holders of money to postpone their purchases. And conversely, when prices start to rise, conventional money incentivizes holders to spend it as soon as possible. In other words, far from being self-adjusting and restoring balance when disturbances occur, modern money does the opposite and exaggerates those disturbances in both directions. Another question that frequently comes up when people first become acquainted with the concept of demurrage is how would we save under such a system? The first thing I'll say is to repeat something I've said before. In my view, the question itself is indicative of irrational preconceived ideas that most of us have probably never consciously examined. There are at least two irrational preconceived notions underlying the question. The first is that we should use a public utility, our legal tender medium of exchange, upon the circulation of which all of our lives depend as a vehicle for saving. 
Silvio Gassel addresses this point very directly and very succinctly. He writes, all the commodities of the world are at the disposal of those who wish to save. So why should they make their savings in the form of money? Money was not made to be saved. The second irrational preconceived notion underlying the question, how will we save, is the, is the idea that money entitles us to receive additional wealth through the growth of those savings. This idea is, in my opinion, deeply irrational. Remember the cocktail napkin. If you receive income without creating wealth, someone else is creating wealth without receiving income. If you gain wealth by saving money, where does that wealth come from? Obviously, someone else is creating it, but you're receiving it. So the answer to the question, how would we save? So to answer the question, how would we save? Let's recall the Robinson Crusoe story. As the stranger told Crusoe, if he wanted to protect his wheat without building a shed, turning over the wheat with wooden shovels and keeping cats, there's another way. Make that capital available to someone else who can put it to productive use. Keeping capital in circulation by putting it at the disposal of someone who can use it is the best way of saving and avoiding the losses that inevitably result when one holds on to stagnant wealth. And this relates to a question that came up during the last class. Marty Rowland observed that there was an apparent inconsistency between something I said and something our guest speaker, Felix Fooders said. The question was whether or not money is capital. Marty heard Felix say that money is not capital, and he heard me say that money is capital. Interestingly enough, when I said that, I was not expressing my own view. I was directly quoting Gassell. So let's revisit that quote. Gassell said, money alone is true, real, basic capital. All other capital objects are completely dependent upon the characteristics of the existing form of money. They are its creatures. They receive the title of nobility, the title of capital, from money. Deprive money of the privilege of forbidding the workers to build new houses, tear down the barrier raised by money between the workers and real capital, and the supply of such things will increase until they lose the characteristics of capital. So the apparent contradiction comes from the fact that we're conflating two different definitions of the word capital. In one sense, capital is used to refer to assets used in commerce the means of production, factories, equipment, houses, etc. But that's not how Gassell uses the word. He uses the word capital to refer to a situation, not an object. Gassell's definition of capital is a situation in which factories, houses, ships, etc. are able to generate excess returns, or as Marx would put it, surplus value. But Gassell writes, this power does not lie in the characteristics of such things, factories, houses, ships, but in the fact that money, precisely as with wares, prepares the market conditions necessary for the collection of interest. The ratio of houses to tenants, of ships to freights, of workmen to factories is regularly, artificially, and inevitably so constituted by the present form of money that demand, tenants and workers, is always faced with an insufficient supply. This situation is what gives the means of production their capitalistic character. And according to Gassell, if we change to a form of money that does not give the title of nobility to the means of production, houses, factories, and ships will lose their capitalistic character. And this is the answer to Marty's question about the apparent inconsistency between what Felix said and what I said. Felix said that money is not capital. What he meant was that money is not a means of production. What I said, quoting Gassell, is that money is capital, not meaning that it's a means of production, but rather that it is the cause of a situation in which the means of production become capitalistic in character. 
but Gassell tells us that character is not inherent in the nature of the means of production, as Marx believed, but is transferred to the means of production by money. Okay. So remember when I said in the first class that for years and years, I searched for someone to point out the flaw in Gassel's arguments to me and that no one ever did. Well, there was actually one notable exception to that and that was Keynes himself. Ironically, the man who was responsible for the fact that I knew of Gassel in the first place was also the only person I was aware of who made what seemed to be a credible criticism of Gassel's perspective. As I mentioned, Keynes spent five pages in the general theory discussing Gassell. And while his assessment was generally positive, Keynes also made some noteworthy criticisms of Gassell's analysis. So let's go to the text of the general theory and look at what, Gassell, at what Keynes said. Keynes begins by saying that Gassell's work contains flashes of deep insight. But he then says that Gassell only just failed to reach down to the essence of the matter. Keynes says that he initially failed to recognize the merit of Gassell's analysis due to certain palpable defects in the argument. Keynes goes on to say that Gassell distinguishes clearly between the rate of interest and the marginal efficiency of capital. And he argues that it is the rate of interest which sets a limit to the rate of growth of real capital. This, of course, is one of the key elements of Keynes's own explanation for the problems of unemployment and recurring economic crises. So while Keynes claims to have arrived at his conclusions independently, he explicitly acknowledges that Gassell expressed some of the central elements of his theory decades before he published the general theory. Keynes goes on to say that Gassell points out that the rate of interest is a purely monetary phenomenon and that the peculiarity of money from which flows the significance of the money rate of interest lies in the fact that its ownership as a means of storing wealth involves the holder in negligible carrying costs, and that forms of wealth, such as stocks of commodities, which do involve carrying charges, in fact yield a return because of the standard set by money. So here, once again, Keynes acknowledges that Gassell preceded him in explaining how interest affects the creation of productive capital. But then Keynes says that there is a great defect in Gassell's theory. He says that Gassell failed to grasp the notion of liquidity preference, and that Gassell therefore constructed only half a theory of the rate of interest. What does Keynes mean by this? Keynes states that the idea behind stamped money, that is demurrage, is sound. But he says that Gassell was unaware that money was not unique in having a liquidity pre premium attached to it. And he concludes that if currency notes were to be deprived of their liquidity premium by the stamping system, a long series of substitutes would step into their shoes, bank money, debts at call, foreign money, jewelry, and the precious metals generally, and so forth. So Keynes is essentially saying that if we deny money its special advantage by implementing demurrage, the liquidity preference that was previously attached to money would transfer to other types of assets, and that therefore the problem of interest halting the process of capital creation will remain. I'll make one quick remark here, which is that I find Keynes's statements here to be self-contradictory. He first says that the idea of demurrage is sound, but then he says that it won't work. I don't see how these two statements can be reconciled. If demurrage won't eliminate liquidity preference and thereby enable the process of capital formation to continue beyond the limit currently caused by hoardable money, then that means the idea of demurrage is not sound. It seems that maybe Keynes was confused. So as I said, I came across this assessment of Gassell for the first time in 2007. At that time, I held Keynes in such high regard that the idea that he might have been confused didn't even occur to me. On the other hand, I didn't see how the objections raised by Keynes in any way took away from Gassell's analysis. 
basically Keynes was saying that if people can't hoard money, they'll hoard other things. And yes, that's obviously true. But the question is whether or not the hoarding of those other assets would have the same impact on the capital creation process as does the hoarding of money. I didn't see why it would, but I assumed that Keynes knew what he was talking about. So for the next 15 years or so, I had this lingering element of doubt hang hanging over my own opinion of Gassell. I considered his analysis undeniably brilliant, but I also entertained the possibility that Keynes saw something that I didn't, and that as a result, Gassell's solution to the problem would not actually work. That doubt persisted until I met tonight's special guest. Dr. Ahmed Anwar is a professor of economics at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. He wrote a paper in 2020 entitled From Keynes's Liquidity Preference to Gassell's Basic Interest, in which he reviews both perspectives on interest and examines the supposed great defect in Gassell's analysis. He concludes that it was in fact Keynes who had the great defect and that only Gassell's proposals represent a real solution to the problem of interest. His paper was a revelation for me. It finally enabled me to understand the substance of Keynes's criticisms, which had been such a source of doubt for me for so, for so many years. I believe that Dr. Anwar has fully digested both the Gassellian and Keynesian perspectives and I agree with his verdict in favor of Gassell. By the way, a link to his paper can be found at silviogassell.com. So once I read the paper, I reached out to Dr. Anwar because I wanted to discuss it with him. He's been extremely generous with his time and we've been meeting weekly on Zoom for the past four or five months. We've explored a wide variety of issues related to Gassell, Keynes, theories of interest and money and more. I'm so grateful for the help that he's given me in terms of improving my own understanding of these issues. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Anwar and ask him to share his understanding of the gassell keynes connection. Dr. Anwar? I'll just start with a little introduction. So thanks, first of all, Josh, for, for your introduction. Um, so my, I'm a microeconomic theorist from, um, well, certainly uh, from my PhD. Um, areas of interest were auction theory and evolutionary game theory. And then at some point I switched uh, to um, trying to understand complex systems and system systems uh, theory and uh, became interested in monetary theory. Um, and it was um, uh, around 2017 when I first came across Gazelle, and it was a student of mine who was uh, writing his dissertation on uh, Gazelle. And I have to say it was a, a re revelation, uh, especially given my interest at the time in trying to understand uh, systems and, you know, particularly the monetary system. And I, I felt that it, it filled in a gap that had been missing in, in my understanding. And um, I subsequently uh, discovered from discussions with the student who was uh, you know, uh, researching this that um, uh, in the in the uh, literature since um, Keynes's general theory, uh, Gazelle's theories have just been uh, dismissed um, based on uh, Keynes's critique, and. I have to say, right from the start, I had a, a difficulty with Keynes' uh, critique. Um, so I undertook to try and understand what was um, missing. And um, what I, I, I did the thing that you do if you really want to uh, embark on a new research project, which is to teach a course on it. And um, it's from that course that I, I, I subsequently wrote this paper. Um, so I'll, I'll just try and give a, a brief summary of um, uh, what uh, what, I, what I found. Um, now, just prior to that uh, um, uh, bit on the notion of liquidity preference had escaped him, uh, Keynes also says he fails to explain why the money rate of interest is not governed, as the classical school maintains, by the standard set by the yield on productive capital. So. 
this bit of what Keynes says, we can dismiss, dismiss straight away. And it's actually hard to understand how Keynes says this, given what he's already um, said um, uh, about his understanding of uh, uh, Gazelle's theory and its similarity with his theory. Um, then on the notion of liquidity preference had escaped him. Um, I think here we have to see that um, Keynes most likely didn't read all of a natural economic order. And there are parts of a natural economic order where Gazelle is very explicitly thinking in terms of a liquidity schedule that uh, Keynes actually uses in the general theory. Um, it is true that this wasn't the focus of Gazelle's analysis, but what we can say from Keynes's development here is rather than undermining uh, the um, theory of basic interest, it's giving it stronger foundations. So whereas Gazelle focuses on the uh, exchange process uh, to give rise to basic interest, Keynes is focusing on this feeling that we have uh, of safety in holding money. And, um, you know, these are two sides of the same thing. And what uh, Keynes really adds to this is the importance of uncertainty in the economic system. And, um, you know, this is at the, um, the heart of why we, we need money in the system at all. Um, so I think neither of those are really um, undermining the, uh, Gazelle's theory. So I think the, 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 the damning pa passages are really on these alternative stores of value. And th there is another passage that, um, well, I'll just, I, I won't read it out, but um, there is an aspect of chapter 17 uh, of the general theory um, where Keynes is really uh, presenting a model that uh, uh, you, you can say is um, Gazelle's theory. And one problem with it is he's he's not seeing or not making a distinction between two rates of interest or two rates of return, I should say. One is the return on holding money, and the other is the return on lending money. So he's um, considering these to be the same thing. Now, of course, the whole point of Gazelle's reform is to separate money as a from being a store of value to being just a medium of exchange. And uh, that is in fact separating two, these two rates. So by arbitrage, you're not going to get these sex rates equal. You have a boundary solution where no money is held at all, in which case the rate on holding money can be less than the rate, of, uh, the rate you get on lending money. And when you uh, initially um, uh, uh, implement this reform, the rate on lending money is, you know, still going to be uh, five or six or percent, or you know, whatever the return on capital is at the time. It's only over time, as capital accumulates, that the return on uh, lending money is going to come down. Um, so, because he's not seeing this dis distinction, there is this confusion, and that perhaps is at the heart of uh, the, the statements he makes next on um, why other stores of value might. Um, uh, 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 prevent this uh, dermorage from, um, uh, you know, allowing the capital accumulation to continue. So the crucial thing is by having this um, tax on holding money, you're making money neutral in the sense that you're just indifferent between holding it for transactions purposes and you know uh, lending it. Let's say so. It, uh, so you're willing to, um, it, uh, you're not holding it as a store of, of wealth anymore. And um, the, the crucial aspect of this is that money still retains um, that property that is the most liquid asset. So it's not that you're taking away the liquidity of it. It's still the thing that we use as a medium of exchange. It's just that you're neutralizing that liquidity with a, with a tax. So you, you don't hold it as a store of value. And um, so uh, I wasn't entirely sure from uh, reading his critique. Uh, I mean, I, I was reasonably sure that it was just this store of value problem. But another thing that you might think is a concern for him is that money actually loses 
the property of being a medium of exchange in this uncertain world that we live in. That there's this, there's this demand that we have, and this is this is a view of some post Keynesians that it's, it's uncertainty that means that we we need to have um, you know money money needs to have that property that is also a store of value. Um, just last uh, last year, um, we had the publication of some letters between uh, a German economist who was a follower of um, Gazelle called Hotstetter and Keynes. And, and these are really revealing. And it becomes clear there that Keynes is, in fact, simply thinking of the problem as being that um, there will be alternative stores of value. And here we see... Uh, this confusion that Keynes has. So the whole point of the gazelle reform is that you store your wealth in other things. Now, it can be gold or Bitcoin, or it can be real capital. And the problem Keynes is uh, highlighting is if it's gold instead of real capital, we might have another lower bound. Okay, It might be lower than the lower bound set by money. And that, that seems to be his concern. But the crucial thing about Gazelle's reform is you can never have money leaking out of the exchange system. So you never have the start of a crisis because there's deficient demand. So something else has to give then. So if we're storing our wealth in gold, the initial thing that's going to happen if you know there's a convention and we're all coordinating on this and storing our wealth in gold or anything else, well, the price of that thing will just go up and it will continue to go up and still, you know, until You've got a balance of people who are wanting to buy and sell it. But crucially, at any point in time, when somebody buys the gold, there's somebody else um, selling the gold who now has money that they don't want. They're not selling this gold to hold this money because it, this money now has this tax on it. They must be selling it to use it in the, either to use it in the exchange system or to buy other assets. So crucially, this money never leaks out of the system. So it can never even start the process that uh, Keynes is then concerned about. The other problem, is, I think, with Keynes's way of thinking is, although he's trying to escape from um, an equilibrium way of thinking to a more dynamic way of thinking in this uncertain world, he does hang a lot on his investment savings equilibrium that, you know, that determines uh, income. And then investment is essentially is then determining um, the equilibrium, and you can have an unemployment equilibrium. And so he's concerned about the wrong level of investment giving rise, you know, if there's this lower bound giving rise to an unemployment equilibrium still. Um, but that, uh, we've now got a system where you never have deficient demand that gives rise to a process where. Um, so a simple way to put it, we're now in this classical world where Say's law actually applies. And it's the failure of Say's law that Keynes himself identifies as a problem early in um, uh, the general theory. OK, so I, I've just noticed the time. I've maybe spent more time than uh, Josh was wanting, but uh, I think I, I can stop there. And uh, I'm happy to answer questions uh, at the end. All right. Thank you so much, Professor Anwar, for sharing your perspective with us. Um, <clears throat> before we get to questions and answers, I'd just like to say a few last words on the subject of Gisela and Keynes. As I've said since the first session of this course, one of the biggest impediments to achieving a clear understanding of money is the irrational status quo and the largely unexamined assumptions upon which it's built. I argued that, the, that assimilating the Gesellian view is much less about learning new ideas and much more about examining old ideas and discarding them if we find that they don't hold up to rational scrutiny. But that's an extremely difficult process. Unlearning long-held beliefs is much harder than learning new things because the hold that those beliefs have on us operates not just at the intellectual level, it also works at the emotional and psychological levels. So it's a very uncomfortable process to bring those ideas to light, to examine them, and to discard them if we find that they don't make sense. An illustration of just how hard that is to do is the fact that Keynes himself was a victim, just like all of us of irrational preconceived notions that he was unable to fully see through. 
He got caught up in the confusion of money's contradictory nature as a medium of exchange and a store of value. And it was this confusion that prevented him from fully understanding and integrating the Gesellian perspective. So my own appraisal of Keynes has changed a lot as a result of my conversations with Dr. Anwar. Previously, I viewed Keynes as an unimpeachable authority when it came to economics. And that's why his criticisms of Gesell were so challenging for me. But now I have a different view of Keynes. Dr. Anwar has described Keynes as extraordinarily clever, and he undoubtedly was extraordinarily clever, but he was also a limited, fallible human being like all the rest of us. Anyway, like I've said from the beginning, the whole, in the whole purpose of this inquiry is not to build a church to Silvio Gassell or to Keynes or to Henry George. It's about taking the useful, valid parts of all of their perspectives in order to synthesize the most complete understanding possible of how the economy works so that we can come up with the best solutions possible to our economic problems. Remember Gassell's quote, of the discoverer's name, truth takes no account. All right, that's everything for today.